Hello, everyone. We have a very important episode of Chat with an Affiliate today. As you know, real estate fraud cases are on the rise here in the US, including Central Texas. Today, I have Kara McGregor, Senior Vice President of Business Development with Independence Title. Kara is here to help us explain what is going on and what you need to do to protect your clients and your business. Thank you for joining us today, Kara. Thanks for having me in. So awesome for you to be here. Let's get started. First things first, what type of real estate fraud are title companies seeing right now? Well, first of all, most everyone is familiar at this point with wire fraud, and that's still a threat. It's still something that we need to continue to educate our buyers and sellers about um, to prevent their money from getting diverted through uh, false wiring instructions. Um, but I think our real estate community is pretty on top of this now and understands the safeguards that have to be in place. The new thing that we're seeing is often referred to as seller fraud. Um, what that involves is a, is a fraudster posing as a property owner, sometimes creating fake credentials, but with the aim of selling the property, stealing the proceeds and disappearing. One thing you mentioned was seller's fraud. As I was sitting here, I was thinking there might be a few members watching today who aren't as familiar with seller's fraud. Can you give us a little overview of what seller's fraud is? Sure. So as I said, um, typically there's a criminal posing as the property owner. Um, they might have very uh, convincing identification, um, legal documents uh, that are uh, generated in order to support their claim of being the property owner. They will contact a real estate agent Typically, they want to list the property below market value. They want this thing to move fast before they get caught. Um, they want cash um, and they don't want to communicate in person. Um, the type of property that's involved is usually unoccupied, so either vacant land or an unoccupied house. In other words, there's no one on site to tip anyone off. Yeah, it's, it's funny because it's all the things that you listed are the things that a typical, age, a typical agent would be really excited to get cash off or right away, ready to close. So I can definitely understand uh, where that might become of interest. And that's an excellent point because I think these fraudsters are well aware of the movements of the real estate market and they understand that realtors are very eager right now for um, quick transactions. 100%. With that being said, Kara, with so many people being involved in the real estate transaction, you're talking your realtor, your lender, the title. How does something like this even happen? I think there's several reasons why, uh, you know, it starts with the fact that at the level of those first conversations with a real estate agent, it has not been a normal thing for a realtor to have to authenticate the idea of someone who proposes to be the owner of the property. Um, you know, I think the other challenge is that there's so many ways now to work remotely that a fraudster could never be face to face with the realtor. Um, and uh, and there's a lot of transactions that happen that way entirely remote. Um, the a fraudster in this kind of um, situation usually requests a remote closing. Um, they don't want to be in person face to face with anyone if they don't if they can avoid it. Um, and you know, even talking on the phone sometimes is, is something they avoid. Although we've had some scenarios where uh, they, the fraudster will get on the phone and, and has you know, practiced a little bit uh, to come off convincingly as the seller of this property. It's amazing that these days, you never know what you're gonna get. I think we constantly, whether it be in your work life or your personal life, nowadays between scammers and people who are phishing your email, mm -hmm. there is always um, something that you have to be a little bit more aware of so that you don't get caught in those situations. So with that being said, Kara, what are some safeguards and best practices that independence title employs to catch fraudulent activity in a real estate transaction? Independence title and title companies generally should be looking for these kinds of solutions. Um, we've started moving into a knowledge-based authentication, um, which uh, some people are familiar with as the its most common form, which is static knowledge-based. So if you've ever set up access to your bank account with your password and then they ask you to set up certain questions to recover your password. Mm -hmm. um, where were you born? The name of your first pet, you know, those sorts of things. That's static knowledge base. The, the user is providing those questions. Um, the dynamic knowledge base authentication, which is kind of the next wave, 
And it's a little scary, but uh, but it, it's it's using all the information out there about us for the good. Um, so uh, the dynamic knowledge-based authentication will ask you questions just gleaned from your activity online um, and from public records. So one of those questions might be, you know, which of these addresses did you live yes. in at, in 2005, for instance? Or it might ask you about a most recent purchase. Um, or um, uh, someplace you've traveled recently. It's just looking at your digital footprint um, in order to authenticate uh, you as, as a person that's engaged with this activity. Um, this is a, a more secure approach to uh, authenticating the identification of a proposed seller. I love that. I love that Independence Title is ahead of that and they're progressive in making sure that you're offering that not just first level of identification, the second level. And I think um, from consumer standpoint of view, it's always nice, even though it might take a little bit more time or you do have to think back to, did I live there, <laughs> you know, three or four years ago? Yeah. But I think it is, um, it's a little reassuring also to the consumer to know that there's a little bit of extra protection uh, being given to them and a great way for all of you members out there to share that with your your buyers and sellers and letting them know that there is an extra precaution mm -hmm. that is available to them. So wonderful. With that, realtors are often the first point of contact with fraudsters. What red flags should they look for and what are some of those best practices? That's a great question. Um, first of all, we've touched on some of the characterizations that, that, that may raise a red flag about a false uh, property owner. Um, not wanting to meet in person, um, uh, avoiding face-to-face -face contact, um, being very rushed, listing below market value, um, insisting on cash. These people are often kind of pushy and intimidating just to kind of make things go the mm -hmm. way they want them to go. Um, so those are some red flags. Um, best practices would include insist on an in-person meeting, even if it's just via Zoom, You'd be face-to-face -face, um, with with your proposed sellers. Um, I think uh, another great best practice is that listing, ask that uh, seller for copies of their past closing documents. Mm, sure. um, you know, an authentic seller is probably gonna have their title policy and their old survey. And you need these things anyway uh, to help facilitate uh, the transaction. Um, so I would just make sure you're asking for those documents at the listing appointment. Um, finally, I would just Google the name of this person and see if you can independently find a cell phone number, past addresses, and ask those questions of uh, your purported property owner. Um, you know, it's, it's awful to get all the way to contract, um, having invested all that time marketing a property and spending time with the parties. Um, but if it comes all the way to contract, then, you know, title companies uh, have another layer of, of investigation. Um, but ideally, you know, for a realtor, you want to uncover this early on. Absolutely. It resonates with me in the sense of those best practices that you spoke about, mm -hmm. whether you are a seasoned agent, whether you are a rookie agent, I think we get in this day-to-day -day business where you know what the next step is when it comes to a transaction, when you're speaking with a client. But these are things that you have to take it back to the basics. It almost goes back to the core of professionalism when you are checking what are the things that I need to do to offer the best service to my clients. So I love those best practices, and I hope that everyone will take those to know, again, no matter where you are um, in your real estate career. One thing I'd like to kind of shift to is should a home buyer or property owner even fall victim to real estate fraud? And what is your opinion on that? Um, it's an awful thing to happen. And of course, all of us uh, professionals in the industry, you know, should be committed to doing everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but if a transaction closes and the money disappears uh, via a fraudulent seller, um, hopefully the parties have a title insurance policy. Um, the new buyer, if a title company closed this without catching it, they issue a title policy that does protect um, the interests of the parties to that contract. Um, beyond that, uh, law enforcement has to get involved, both local and federal, and, um, and the machine starts moving. Starts rolling from there. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, again, a good reminder that uh, title insurance will, will also help um, in those transactions. So. 
I have really enjoyed this conversation, and I, I do think that this is extremely valuable <clears throat> information, and I think it's something that we definitely wanted to share with all of our members. One thing that we're going to end with is a call to action, and I think this is super important. What are three things that all Central Texas realtors should know now to protect their clients from this type of fraud? Well, first of all, just raising awareness that this exists, that people might claim to own a property who don't. Um, and just have that awareness and, and, and uh, have, be paying attention. Um, we listed some red flags to look for in, in engaging with potential sellers, um, but let's make it easy for three bullet points. First of all, you know, ask for an in-person meeting, mm -hmm. um, ask for copies of documents from previous closing, and do some Googling. Try to find a, a way to contact that seller independently of the contact informa information they have presented. Um, and just make sure you're dealing with the right person. Best practices, professionalism, and being top of your game. I think all of that completely sums it up. And I'll add one last bit. Talk with your title reps. This is why we have Kara here today. Find out who your people are, Get take them to coffee, get to understand what they're seeing so that you can be a little bit more on top of your game if you run across some of those flags. So great information. Thank you again for joining me today, Kara. Again, this has been so valuable and we'll see you next time on Chat with an Affiliate.